Hello to everyone watching. I'm Patrick Bannon, president of the Bellevue Downtown Association. Welcome to the BDA's 2020 live stream conversation with Mayor Lynn Robinson and Deputy Mayor Jared Neuenhouse. We're going to talk about the state of the city. We're coming to you live from the Bellevue Downtown Association in our retrofitted conference room slash studio. It's certainly a sign of the times, but we want to assure you that we're being safe. We're socially distanced, six feet away, with plastic barriers and good ventilation. And to better understand our speakers, we'll be chatting without our masks. However, wherever you go, we encourage everyone out there to mask up. Mask up, Bellevue. It's critical that we do fight this pandemic together. Today's live stream program is made possible through the support of our sponsors. They are Heritage Bank, Kaiser Permanente, Puget Sound Energy, and Vulcan Real Estate. Our member sponsors support the BDA's work to offer high quality programming around key issues. Sharing information these days is more important than ever, and we're grateful for their generosity. Our discussion will focus on challenges and opportunities here in Bellevue and how the city's elected leadership is working to respond and plan for the future. It's a fireside conversation where, where I will ask the mayor and deputy mayor, uh, mayor a series of questions. And to help source our questions, we asked BDA members two weeks ago to rank top of mind issues. Organizations responded to the flash poll. Top two issues at the time were public health and safety and workforce trends. The bottom two were transportation impacts and social unrest. However, what may not have been a key issue two weeks ago can quickly emerge as a top priority. Issues are fluid, they ebb and they flow, and can define the work of city building. Working on those issues are people, those who are willing to step forward and take on the opportunity to lead. I'm pleased our special guests are joining us today to help unpack the latest insights on the state of the city. Mayor Lynn Robinson was elected to the Bellevue Council in 2014. She was deputy mayor from 2018 to 19 and has been serving as mayor since the start of the year. Deputy Mayor Jared Newenhouse was elected to the Bellevue Council in 2018 and began his service as deputy mayor at the beginning of the year. Before we start the conversation, here is a short video produced by the City of Bellevue for this State of the City event.
we're back and ready to begin our fireside chat. We'll start with Mayor Robinson. This is a historic, unprecedented time for Bellevue and cities all across our nation that are being challenged to serve and lead in new ways. What are some issues or examples or instances that make this a defining moment for Bellevue? Well, first of all, Patrick, thank you so much in the BDA for having us here today. I always look forward to this event, and frankly, I was kind of wondering how we were going to do it this year, but here we are, done a great job, and I'm very excited to be here. And I think um, some of the defining moments have been the help and the support that I've seen throughout the city. This is a very, very difficult time. It's difficult for our businesses and for our community members, but the, the response has been incredible. So the city of Bellevue itself has contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to our human service organizations, and we continue to do that. The BDA, the, the chamber, the city's economic, economic development team, you know, have paired together to provide supplies and resources and information to all our businesses and to our communities. Our hospital, Overlake Hospital, is a, is an, a national example for how to treat COVID patients. Our police, during a very challenging moment, exemplified the very behavior that our entire country is fighting for right now to uh, be able to de-escalate in a very tense situation, and I'm so proud of them. Our schools have stepped up and they're providing free meals and child care, and they're providing meals not only to the Bellevue School District kids and their families, but to anybody who has uh, food insecurity. And our community members themselves have done so much, you know, individually and organizations like the Rotary Club, providing food to our first responders. Um, the nonprofits, they're working 24 seven right now to try to serve the needs of the community. And our large corporations, Microsoft, Amazon, Symmetra, PSE, they've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to our community and I hope they continue to do so as well. Deputy Mayor Newen House, building on that, five months ago, our community entered new living and working conditions uh, due to the pandemic. Since then, people and organizations have rallied in so many different ways to meet critical needs. How did the city of Bellevue adjust and respond? What's been the most effective measure and where is there room for improvement in the city's response? No, great question, Patrick. And uh, first of all, as well, I'd like to just thank you for having us uh, here th this morning and thank the, the great BDA membership and sponsors of this uh, event. Although I wish we could be doing this in person still at uh, the Bellevue Club or Maidenbauer Center, but uh, um, still it's great, uh, great to ever have everyone here, hopefully watching from home or watching from work this morning. So, um, you know, first of all, I'm just very thankful for the strong leadership that uh, Mayor Robinson and the city manager Miyaki has shown throughout this process, um, as, as well as the great leadership of the uh, the partnerships that the, the mayor referred to there, uh, the strong leadership uh, from you, Patrick, in the BDA, and from Joe Fain at the chamber um, has been uh, so critical to our response here um, in, in, in numerous ways. Um, but the most critical is getting out the most critical information to our residents, to our businesses, um, as well as the distribution of uh, PPEs, which is just so critical right now, be it the, either the hand sanitizer or the masks or any other type of uh, personal protection equipment that people need at this time. But a, a few specifics that the city has been involved in, um, you know, we've uh, secured over $1 million, additional dollars, into our um, uh, uh, human services funding, and that includes rental assistance, which is so critical right now uh, for those that might be experiencing unemployment. Um, then we also put together just extensive websites resources as well um, that most can be found at the three organizations that I mentioned earlier the city of Bellevue the BDA or the chamber itself um, and and that business support is everything from technical assistance if they're transitioning to a, a you know a virtual environment how do they do that um, to loan navigation um, to permits for um, expanded outdoor seating for example for for a restaurant um, and um, we've also done things like uh, suspended water shutoffs um, you know if, if a payment is late 
wage or they're unable to make that payment, um, or deferred um, local small business taxes. Um, uh, that has also been another uh, tactic that we've used. And then it's just really about a lot of extended outreach that we've done as well. Um, it's the po postcards that we send out to residents. It's the informational resource flyers that we've sent out to, to businesses. And all of these have been in multiple languages. So we're trying to hit um, as much of the city as possible. Um, and then developing a, a really fantastic map that shows all the businesses throughout Bellevue, um, if they're open um, or, or if not, if they are open and what capacity. Um, you know, if it's a restaurant, do they have dine-in or is it delivery only or, or takeout only? Um, or there are, does that restaurant happen to have different um, uh, various uh, protocols that one would have to adhere to um, if, if, if going there? So um, and then we also had the, uh, the It's Your City Special Edition, which addressed uh, just a, a plethora of uh, COVID-19 issues as well. Um, and then the Engaging uh, Bellevue uh, interactive website as well, which is a tremendous resource, for, again, for both our business community and our residents. So the response has been um, has been massive, and I'm so proud of the city in terms of the city's ab ability to pivot as well. Um, we had to pivot to um, you know work at home environment and putting a lot of services online, and the city's just done a tremendous job doing that. Now, in terms of what we can do to get better, it might be a little bit early. Uh, you know, I still think we're maybe in the first uh, inning here um, in terms of, of, of the pandemic, um, and I think a postmortem um, after we're, we're, we're through with this uh, would be the right thing to do and to examine how we can get better or what we can do differently next time around. Um, that's not to say that we're not constantly looking to improve what we're doing, um, and we're really reacting as quickly as possible whenever we do hear emerging trends uh, from residents and, and from businesses, and there's, um, you know, actionable items that we can take uh, to actually uh, to help with those issues. Mayor Robinson, the deputy mayor, touched on the quick response, the shift, the pivot that the city's made. And we've all had to adapt with new communication tools and different approaches to meet, meet needs in the community. As an elected official, share with us how the city council has managed to conduct business and lead in this new environment. Well, Bellevue has a very effective government working for it. You know, you have seven council members, each of who is passionate about the success of the city. And you've got um, seven people who come from completely different life experiences and backgrounds, all working together to make good decisions for the city. We continue to have our weekly council meetings. They're virtual. And we're getting through a lot of material. I think we're, you know, maybe being even more efficient than before. So I'm really happy with the progress that we're making. Um, our, I'm, I'm doing more meetings myself daily than I've ever been able to do just because I don't have any travel time. And I'm also able to have regional and federal level meetings that I have been difficult to have in the past. So that's, that's a positive change. Our city manager has been so nimble, you know, he has to adapt every day to the emerging needs of the city and he's doing an excellent job. Our staff continues to serve the community. They, they do it in person, they do it virtually on the phone, they do it through mailers. Um, you know, we continue to have an active city government and our webpage uh, is updated daily with information on council related activities city citywide information as well as COVID specific uh, information and it has a very good business information page that updates all the time and uh, something that people should be looking into. So we, we continue to have a very effective government in Bellevue. So as, we, as we've learned in dealing with the crisis, we, we can't predict what will happen next week or even next year. Before the pandemic, the city council was anchored to a defined vision, uh, one that cast where Bellevue would be five, 10 years from now. So today, with so much uncertainty and change, how do you sustain the vision for the city? You know, Bellevue is unique from some of the cities around us. We have a council, uh, a city manager form of government, and uh, on average, a city manager lasts about 15 years in a city, and whereas an elected mayor on average is, changes every four years, and usually with that changes the vision of the city. So our city manager is kind of the keeper of the vision, and we, we create a 20-year vision 
that we update every four years. And from that, we have our guiding principles that we update every two years. And every policy decision that we make is based on our guiding principles and on that vision. And so we have a real continuity of vision in Bellevue that is efficient and uh, saves money and you get really good results from it. And I think looking at the downtown and that definition between our, our downtown core and our neighborhoods is a good example of something that was decided 20 years ago. They put, the city leaders put a line through residential areas and said, this is gonna be our downtown, these are gonna be our neighborhoods, and you don't see the urban sprawl here that you see in other cities. Um, and the, the, long, the long-term vision that I, we have for, for Bellevue is very exciting. You know, I look at the Grand Connection and I think about this connection, this ped bike connection that will go all the way from Maidenbauer Bay through the downtown core of Bellevue across 405 into Wilburton, connecting the downtown with the Wilburton and the Spring District. I mean, what an amazing asset that's gonna be for the community and not just for the businesses, uh, it's going to be wonderful for the people who work in Bellevue and especially for the community to have this almost like the Bellevue Street Fair environment year-round where there'll be music and art and food and nature and just a really nice, safe experience for people to get through the downtown core. So looking forward, but then also coming back to today and the challenges that we face Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, on top of the pandemic, the killing of George Floyd brought issues of racial injustice, police use of force, and the Black Lives Movement into our hearts, our living rooms, and onto our streets. And unfortunately, as we experienced in Bellevue on May 31st, some groups took advantage of the protests, resulting in property damage and looting in our downtown. So these issues intersect with public safety, and I know public safety is a big component of the vision as we look forward to. What is Bellevue doing to help move the community forward on the issue of public safety? And can you share more about what the Bellevue Police Department is specifically doing in response? Yeah, thanks for that question, Patrick. Um, so with this, uh, I hearken back to a quote by uh, Barack Obama back in 2012, although I think he borrowed some inspiration from uh, Abraham Lincoln when he said, we don't have a perfect union, but we have a perfectible union. Um, the killing of George Floyd, I think, raised an issue that's important for, for, for our community to discuss and have conversations around. Um, the, you know, the racial equity with social justice movement um, that has followed reminds us that uh, we need to do more to confront racism head on. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, in response to those protests, as you may have heard, the, the Bellevue City Council took a pledge um, to look at the Bellevue Police Department's use of force, safety practices, et cetera. Um, that pledge commits the city to the following actions. I just want to list them off. Uh, one is to review um, the police use of force policy. Uh, second is to engage the community um, by including a diverse range of input. Um, experiences and stories to review. Um, third is to report the findings of the review to the community and then seek additional feedback. And then finally is uh, reform, to see if there's any reform that does need um, to be addressed or, or is needed to be implemented. Um, but I think what we also learned on that May 31st that you referenced is that police is essential to the public safety of our city. I don't think this is controversial and it should not be controversial. Um, I think that was on full display during the rioting and looting of, the, of that day. Um, you know, that was, that was a painful lesson. I think Bellevue lost a little bit of its innocence that, that day. You know, that was something that uh, was always somewhere else, that something like that could not happen to Bellevue, but it did. Um, so I think that was a good learning lesson for us. Um, but, you know, we have to look at the bigger picture here as, as much as the, I think, some of the, the anger and the frustration that a lot of business owners uh, felt that day. Um, we can also thank the professionals on the Bellevue Police Department um, that uh, thanks to their leadership and, and the leadership by Chief Milet, um, you know, the, the bigger picture items of no loss of life, uh, no, no uh, arson except for, I think, one truck um, that, that, that was set on fire. Um, there was no, um, no serious injuries. Um, so 
and, and really no violent crimes other than the, the tagging, the, the vandalism, and, and, and the looting. Now, not that that's not serious, and we are taking it very serious, and the, the Bellevue Police Department um, has actively, thanks to the wonderful residents and businesses uh, that have captured video and photographs of those looters, uh, the, the Bellevue Police Department has actively gone after um, as many as possible. In fact, we've already made over 23 arrests to date, and there will be more coming in the, in the days ahead. Um, and we are actively pressuring the King County Prosecutor's Office to make sure that they are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I think uh, that's important for um, our residents and businesses to hear. So, um, but getting back to the, you know, the, the continuous improvement, um, you know, I, I think um, Chief Milet is making sure this never happens again. Um, almost immediately, there was a task force that was put together that uh, with uh, Seattle's uh, Chief Best and, and Chief Milet and others uh, to learn from this. Well, you know, who were these uh, um, actors? Uh, what tax tactics did they use? Um, what we, might we do the next time to make sure that this doesn't happen again in downtown Bellevue? So um, as, as well as improving the communication, and thanks uh, again to the BDA and Chambers and others, to be able to communicate even more quickly with our businesses the next time around um, uh, in, in order to uh, be, uh, be more prepared if we think this might happen again. Uh, obviously, all of us hope that never does, um, but certainly uh, we want to be prepared if it, if, if it does happen. So so, um, but, you know, I think we need to keep in mind, too, that, um, you know, the Bellevue Police Department is a world-class organization, one of the best police departments in, in, in the country. And that's not just my opinion. They are, um, and, and I'll explain to you why that is, uh, they are nationally accredited. And to some people that might not mean that much, but when you take into consideration that only 6% of all the police departments in the country are nationally accredited, that is really saying something. Um, the amount of work that they need to do um, to be accredited is, is quite something, and I just want to list off a, a few things because it's really important because never has a nationally accredited police department ever ended up under a DOJ consent decree for a pattern of excessive force. Excessive force. It's never happened. So that tells you the importance of, of that training because there's over 400 separate standards that they need to meet. And the, uh, the training that encompasses the best practices in policing and promoting the community building and the accountability, the strong uh, training standards that I referenced, including diversity training, de-escalation, et cetera. So, um, you know, a lot of these things that we're doing already are exactly what some people have asked us to, to, to review. And we're happy to do that because we are always open to a continuous improvement here in the city of Bellevue, no matter what department it is. But I'm so proud of our police department have already been proactively doing so many of these things already. So um, on top of that, I just want to mention as well, because uh, Chief Milet set up these six different advisory groups, uh, black, Muslim, LGBTQI, um, uh, interfaith, um, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple of other ones here, uh, but, uh, oh, uh, Asian Pacific Islander. So the Bellevue Police Department is constantly looking for uh, input and feedback on how to improve policing, those com community policing in our city. So at the end of the day, um, we've got a great police department. We can always get better. Um, we're going to make sure that never happens again, um, and we're always open to that continuous improvement. So systemic racism equity and inclusion are national issues at the forefront for organizations, businesses of all sizes. And we've seen effective change can be sparked and actually accomplished at the local level. Mm -hmm. What efforts will the city undertake to ensure Bellevue leads on these issues? Yeah, um, that's a great follow-up question because um, as hopefully most people know, um, Bellevue is now a minority majority city. Uh, in 2010, the percentage of people of color living in Bellevue um, was around 41 percent, but by 2018, it's now 51 percent um, and, and growing. So, you know, the city of Bellevue has always taken diversity very seriously, um, and um, you know, we're not starting at zero by any by any means. Um, so, the council adopted the diversity advantage program uh, or plan, I should say, in 2014, and then we have 
have a three-person ad, uh, diversity advantage um, uh, team on, on staff. Uh, and the importance of that is these types of programs, I'm just going to list off here, that they have, uh, have launched has just been critical as part of this. The diversity and equity training. So by 2020, every city of Bellevue uh, employee has gone through uh, cultural competency training. Um, equitable hiring and advancement. I mean, this is really to ensure there's no implicit bias um, uh, or, 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 or even, you know, uh, implicit bias or not to reach and hire a more diverse um, set of employees for the city of Bellevue. The equitable procurement, procurement um, through workshops, understand diverse businesses, uh, more accessibility, our disability and diversity pledge uh, really details those accessibility features. I mean, recently we just um, uh, now have uh, power wheelchair charging stations throughout the, throughout the city um, as an example of one of those things. So, uh, and then the translation interpretation assistance, um, that's been critical as well to, to non-native English speakers, obviously, so they can get help with on-site bilingual staff, cultural conversations, et cetera. And then the big part of it too is the outreach. It's always so critical and something that I'm always emphasizing. Um, and that's done through the, through the mini city hall, through cultural conversations, through welcoming week, through the uh, MLK annual celebration. Um, and this year we're transitioning from our summer walks to what we're calling the neighborhood town halls. So that'll be virtual via Zoom. But again, the outreach is still gonna be there. It's gotta be a little bit, uh, a little bit flexible though. And then the uh, Bellevue uh, Diversity Advisory Network, which is critical because um, this uh, network provides counsel to the city um, on how to better reach, serve, and communicate with and, and collaborate with Bellevue's diverse community. So um, the, the, the city of Bellevue, at the end of the day, is doing a lot of great things when it comes to uh, diversity and inclusion and equity. And Patrick, you know, um, <clears throat> Jared and I are so proud of the work that the city of Bellevue does with their equity and with the, the police department, but we are always striving to be better. Yeah, thank you. So as we grow, and before the pandemic, we we're certainly on track to grow uh, by leaps and bounds over the next few years here in, in Bellevue, and specifically in, in downtown and the Spring District. Through that growth, I think the city has an increasing opportunity to be an even more welcoming and inclusive city. Looking at the, the economy specifically, we have been through our growth downtown and the Spring District, one of the nation's most active and attractive cities for new development, jobs, housing, other amenities uh, that come with it. So, Mayor Robinson, how do you size up the city's opportunity through this development wave? And then how do we balance the impacts associated with the growth? Yes, you know, balancing that growth and a high quality of life is always a challenge. But um, if we do it right, one sparks the other. And so the things that we do in Bellevue to try to achieve that balance is a very robust planning process. You saw that with the downtown livability program that we, we took years to complete. And we're working on the Bell Red Rezone right now, the Wilburton planning process and our neighborhood look backs. And all, all those uh, robust planning processes are an effort to bring in that balance. Um, another thing that we work towards is uh, equitable amenities. You know, there's no one neighborhood in Bellevue that's better or worse than another. Every neighborhood has excellent public schools. They have access to beautiful parks and green spaces. They have clean water and healthy air. And um, uh, Bellevue nationally ranks very high in population health. And that's the, the kind of uh, ranking that attracts good employers, good in neighbors, and that's what makes Bellevue a great place to be. Small businesses have been particularly hit, uh, especially hard during, during these times. And cities with thriving downtowns depend on these small and mid-sized businesses for a strong, diverse economic base to support overall quality of life for the city. So how is the city prioritizing these businesses and what actions will help guide these small businesses through the pandemic and beyond? Yeah, it's been tough. And you know, our small and medium sized businesses really are the heart and soul of Bellevue. It's so important to preserve them and, and help them get through this tough time. And I think the BDA 
the chamber and uh, the city of Bellevue's economic development team have done a great job of teaming together to provide those resources and information and even supplies that these small businesses need. You know, um, with the guidance of these organizations, our city's businesses have, have acquired 4,000 PPP loans that have preserved 35,000 jobs in our city. Um, we see large businesses helping out the small businesses. Uh, I talked to you about the, the donations that our large employers have given to small business and to community services. Um, I continue to advocate at the national, at the, at the state, at the community and local level for support for our businesses. And I, I just want to tell you what's been really inspiring is seeing how small businesses have helped other small businesses. So a great example of that is Alan Fulp is a BDA board member. He's also president of Liberty, Liberty Bank. And they're a new bank in Bellevue, a small bank. And they have done an amazing job of uh, getting 300 PPP loans for our local businesses for over five, $50 million uh, in loan money. And he has had a 100% application success rate. So seeing, you know, seeing all the support that we have for our, for our precious businesses in Bellevue gives me confidence that we will get through this tough time, but we, we have to continue to work together. Yeah, we need to keep, keep going, just yeah. keep going. Deputy Mayor, much of Bellevue's job growth has been fueled by tech mm -hmm. and large employers, uh, but we know, and as we just discussed, our economy is represented by other professional services, strong retail, great restaurants, hospitality, and attractions. What are the city's latest insights on workforce trends? What do we need to know? Well, it's it's um, it's somewhat ironic, Patrick, because um, as uh, earlier this year, we're looking at um, uh, um, revamping and uh, updating our uh, economic development uh, plan. And, um, you know, some of the uh, comments uh, made by my colleagues, I think myself included, is, you know, making sure that we have a ver very diverse economy here in Bellevue. Ironically, though, it's actually worked to our advantage that uh, we have been so tech heavy in our in our in our growth um, and because tech companies uh, have have been um, better able, better positioned uh, to pivot uh, during this pandemic. I mean, just the bottom line is a lot of tech workers can work from home, where those that might be in the retail or accommodation or restaurant industry, that's not really an option for them. So um, so, so that's been very, very helpful for, for our economy, for sure. And, um, you know, the, the numbers for those industries that I just mentioned uh, are, are not great, and I'm sure no, that comes as no surprise to anybody. You know, the uh, hotel and food services industry, uh, unemployment rate is up to about 48% there. Um, retail trade, um, that's about 26%. Um, and then arts, entertainment, recreation, you know, that's about 22% unemployment right now. So um, again, I don't think that really surprises anybody, um, but uh, still something that um, uh, we're, we're looking at because, um, and trying to help because this is, you know, these disproportionate job losses are really affecting uh, kind of the bottom of the income income scale as well. Um, so we want to address that as, as much as we possibly can. Um, but there there is um, already some glimmers of hope here, um, uh, you know, even during this pandemic. So for example, hotel occupancy has uh, obviously been very heavily impacted by the by the virus, but um, um, it has, uh, occupancy has doubled since April. Okay, so yes, we're going from about 10% to about 20%, but it is an improvement. So that so that still is a, is, is a good sign. You know, traffic volumes into the city have gone up over 50%, and then uh, pedestrian use of crosswalks, um, that's gone up 70 80%. So there are more people that are out about uh, hopefully shopping, going to restaurants or coffee or uh, you name it. So um, um, actually, and biking, which is a passion of mine, that's actually also up um, actually at all-time highs. Uh, so <laughs> that's, uh, you know, a wonderful thing to see as well. But, um, the, you know, the other um, workforce trend that 
that we're seeing, though, um, is obviously the work from home that I mentioned. And it'll be really interesting to see what the long term impacts of that looks like. So, um, you know, we've already have Facebook and, um, you know, Microsoft and Amazon, most of them saying, you know, work from home till the end of the year or maybe Q1 of 2021. Uh, but uh, Google just recently announced that they don't expect their employees to come back into the office until the summer of next year. Um, so now, you know, that, that that's not mandated. It's certainly, um, the, the, you know, if some employees need to come into the office, they can. However, I think it does show a shift um, in some of the mindsets that, you know, people can be effective working from home. They're, you know, they don't actually need to be actually in the office uh, to, to, to be effective. So it'll be really interesting to see what that does um, to kind of the tech landscape going, going forward. But, um, you know, it's a very, you know, during this pandemic, uh, it's a very fluid situation. So something that we'll be uh, uh, tracking very closely moving forward. So connected to our economy, workforce trends, transportation, land uses, housing supply. And Mayor Robinson, pre-COVID, housing supply and affordability was a top issue for the city. I think it remains a top issue for the city. Can you share with us the city's role in solving for supply and affordability? And how has the work advanced to date over the last year? And how will it be prior prioritized moving forward? Well, I think we used to think that affordable housing was optional for our city. And now we realize that it's, it's really essential for economic vitality and for that high livability that we all want. And frankly, right now, we do not have a full spectrum of housing affordabilities. Um, there's less than 10% of our housing is affordable to a family of four earning $100,000 a year. So we continue to work very hard on implementing our affordable housing strategy that we voted in three years ago. And this year, um, since we've been meeting virtually, we've been really working hard to pass some of our incentives. So we've got the rezoning of our church properties. We're looking at, you know, how do we rezone properties in our growth areas to accommodate affordable housing. Um, we've decreased parking requirements in our TOD for affordable housing. We've put in incentives uh, in market rate housing to include affordable housing. And we're partnering with companies like Microsoft to retain some of the affordable housing we already have in Bellevue. Um, the goal that we made three years ago was to create 2,500 affordable units in 10 years. We've already created 500 affordable units and we have 900 more in the pipeline. So stepping back from the big issues at play in this dramatic time of change, we simply, again, keep going and it helps to look around and pay close attention to find inspiration. So this is a question for both of you. Mm. What has been an inspiring moment for you in recent weeks? Deputy sure, Mayor. I'll go for it first. Um, I don't know. For, for for me, it's probably the day after May thirty first, after the day after the the, the riots and the and the looting, um, um, after the uh, the chamber had. Um, got people together at the downtown uh, park and um, so many residents that came out that day um, and so many other businesses looking to help other businesses um, that day to help clean up and remove graffiti and clean up glass. Um, you know, I spent some time just walking around to about half a dozen uh, businesses just to see how they were doing, if there was anything else the city could do, um, was anything not being addressed, was anything that they needed. And um, it was just amazing to me, Patrick, how, um, how really positive almost everyone I spoke to. Um, yes, of course, you know, they don't like picking up glass from their store window, of course not. But no one was saying, I'm leaving Bellevue. No one is saying that that's it, I'm closing up shop, or I don't believe in the vision, or I don't believe in our police department, or anything like that. No, it was, um, too bad this this had to happen. Um, let's get better and let's move forward. And we still believe that uh, Bellevue is the place that we want to be. Um, this is where our home is. This is where our business is. And uh, we want to be part of the solution and not just you know pick up and, and, and leave for greener pastures somewhere somewhere else. I don't think that exists. They should be in Bellevue and they want to be in Bellevue the long in the long term. So that that was just really inspiring to, to, to see. Um, especially after you know being through that you know that traumatic experience for them and, and for their business. Yeah. Mayor Robinson, your inspiring moment. 
Well, I agree with the deputy mayor. I think that next day, watching the businesses recover and and go right back to business, even with with windows boarded up, they were, they were operating, you know, trying to do business as usual. But the most inspiring moment for me was when we showed up at 10 o'clock at the downtown park to start cleanup. The Bellevue High School students had already been there since 6 a.m. and had done most of the work in the downtown park. <laughs> and I, I've never seen high school students get up that early. And I was just so <laughs> impressed. And I, I wish I could thank them personally. Yeah, that's great. So shifting back to key issues, it's a city budget year for us. Indeed. And Deputy Mayor, the city will be facing a decline in revenues due to the pandemic. So first, help us size up the challenge that the city council's facing, that the city's facing, how you'll go about prioritizing spending. And then are there revenue levers that are in consideration? We're seeing Seattle finalize a payroll tax to help offset some of their challenges. Um, how will that impact Bellevue? And is that something that the city of Bellevue would consider? Um, so first of all, it's, it is so great that we have uh, folks, uh, not on the council like Councilmember Robertson, but also staff like Tony Call, our finance director, that have helped us and, and guide the city through um, a situation like this, similar to this, back in 2009, 2010 during, dur during the recession. So that experience is gonna pay dividends for us um, ex extremely moving, moving forward. Um, so, you know, the council's first budget workshop was on June 22nd, um, and we had um, uh, just we just recently had our first public hearing as well on July 27th. And I'll just put a, a plug in for this. Um, please, um, we have two more public hearings on the budget, so we um, are actively looking for that feedback from residents, um, from businesses. Uh, they can go directly to the bellevuewad.gov website to provide that feedback, or they can simply just email the council at council at bellevuewad.gov. But um, we really want to hear, you know, what's important to them, what they want to see in the budget. Um, so uh, just wanted to put that plug in there. So thank you. Um, but um, you know, the budget team has. Uh, looked at uh, really three different scenarios in terms of, uh, of a recovery. Um, and those scenarios are a rapid recovery, uh, moderate, or a moderate plus. Um, but bottom line, we're looking at about a budget gap of between 12 to 16 million. Um, so, you know, something that seriously we're going to have to take a look at. So, um, you know, for, for planning purposes, the finance staff will, you know, take that least optimistic uh, scenario and then start building uh, a current budget process around that. Um, and we expected that the recovery is probably gonna take two to three years. Um, obviously, we all hope it's gonna be quicker um, and it might be quicker for Bellevue than it is for, for other parts of the state. We'll have to wait and see. But um, uh, you know, as far as the scenario goes, that's the current information that we're, we're working with. So, um, but you know, the, 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 the real, uh, deliberation, the real hard work will really start in, in uh, you know, late September, early October, um, because now we're just really in a lot of information gathering process, if you will, because in October, the city manager will submit his initial proposed budget. Um, and then final adoption of that proposed budget will happen at, at the end of December. Um, so, um, so a lot of hard work ahead, but again, really want that input from businesses, uh, business owners, and, and, and residents. Um, now the payroll tax. So um, I, I think my, my, my colleague uh, Conrad Lee uh, likes to say, let's not uh, kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And I think this is uh, perhaps uh, apropos to, to, to the payroll tax. Um, I don't think there's, there's, there, there, there's any appetite uh, to move anything like that forward um, in, the, in the city of Bellevue. I mean, people from all over the world come here already. They want to be in Bellevue. Uh, businesses want to be here in Bellevue. Um, and that's primar primarily because um, they see, or we see as a city, uh, you know, the business community as a partner. Um, and I think that's a really important relationship that, that we do have with, um, uh, with ex existing businesses and new businesses alike. Um, you know, this is um, an exciting time in Bellevue with, um, with Amazon um, having a larger footprint here. A lot of technology companies such as Microsoft, Facebook, SAP, uh, and, and, and T-Mobile. You know, despite the, the merger, T-Mobile's doing a sprint, they still want to make Bellevue their headquarters. I think that's crucially important. Um, and I think it's a testament to, to, to Bellevue as well that they want to remain here. Um, 
you know, and Bellevue is already a global business with over 45 corporate headquarters here, 100 international companies, and 150,000 jobs. You know, it's a track record that we can really be proud of. So, um, but, you know, certainly we're also very, um, you know, we understand that we're in a region and we want all jobs to stay here. Um, you know, if they leave one place, there's no, there's no guarantee um, it's going to you know, automatically come to Bellevue or stay within Washington State. Um, so, you know, we're always actively looking to remain that very business friendly uh, environment that we have here in Bellevue and, and making it very attractive for, you know, both new and um, more established businesses alike. One major component of the city budget is transportation. Mayor Robinson, we've seen through the pandemic that overall trips have been down and they're slowly coming back as more businesses reopen. And traffic relief could be one of the silver linings of the pandemic. However, solutions for mobility and access uh, will be front and center as we bounce back from the pandemic. And we have visible signs of progress going on throughout our city, especially here in downtown. So at the same time, we're going to see budget impacts. So given the realities, what are the city's top transportation moves or priorities over the next year or two? Well, the good news is that the governor made um, transportation construction projects uh, an essential business. So we continue full speed ahead with our transportation projects. We are working with a $100 million federal TIFI loan that we got, I think, about three years ago mm -hmm. to continue with all the road projects that we have in the Spring District. We have federal, um, we have um, regional funding that we're using to complete the Mountains to Sound Greenway project in Factoria. We have a transportation levy that continues to bring in revenues that we are using to do a major transportation project along 112th. And we have funding in our budget to continue the ped bike improvements that we're making on Newport Way and on West Lake, Lake Sammamish Parkway, which are really important to the community. And then we have light rail. You know, it's, it continues to be ahead of schedule and under budget. And we anticipate that by the end of this year, all the construction that is affecting our roads will be completed and the next few years will be um, devoted to electronic and testing work. So we're anticipating a 2023 completion and I'm really looking forward to that. And you know, one thing um, going off of what the deputy mayor said, one statistic I don't know that everybody appreciates is that only about 10% of the people who work in downtown Bellevue live in Bellevue. And so um, that affects our transportation significantly. And it would be my goal that that statistic changes, uh, that we start seeing more people who live in Bellevue, work in Bellevue, more people who work in Bellevue, live in Bellevue. Yeah, and so thinking about past councils, present councils, and the <laughs> decisions that have come together around transportation, we continue to see progress on 405 as well as East Link, as you mentioned. Um, as a resident of Bellevue, what do you think are some of the most important projects that they can look forward to enjoying moving forward? Well, probably the completion of these projects <laughs> is the thing we most look forward to. But, you know, I just think ease of access. So um, being able to take light rail into Seattle and um, having the ability to park your car and not have to find parking um, and, and just buzz into Seattle or, or um, into Redmond, I think that's gonna be great. I think um, doing those um, diamond lanes on 405, we saw the improvement that made to traffic heading north of Bellevue and we need to get that uh, benefit heading south of Bellevue. I'm really excited about the East Trail being connected. Providing a safe ped bike route north-south of Bellevue is going to really serve our bicycle commuters. Great. So as we as we wind down, want to offer an opportunity to the mayor and deputy mayor to share last words, key takeaways, mm -hmm. a charge for the audience who's viewing this program. Uh, we'll start with the deputy mayor. Go ahead and, and offer your closing remarks and charge for the 
the viewers. Sounds good. And then thank you again, Patrick, for having us here today. I really enjoyed the conversation. So, you know, I'll, I'll be short, but, you know, for for me, I've never been more bullish about, about Bellevue. Uh, I have every confidence that Bellevue will um, emerge stronger and better um, than it is today once we shed this pandemic. Um, we still are that shining city on a hill because of the makeup of our residents, quite frankly. Um, residents that, um, that value and ensure a, a strong sense of community, um, a commitment to public safety, um, excellent schools, world-class parks, uh, and a business climate that, quite frankly, is the envy uh, of cities all over the country. So Bellevue is still that place that you want to be, and no matter if you live, work, or play, it's the place you want to be. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate it. Yeah. Mayor Robinson is, is mayor of the city uh, in helping move our community forward. What, what words would you like to say with the viewers? Well, I know that this is a very challenging time. It really is for our businesses and for our community members. But from what I hear regionally and federally and locally, our city is better positioned than any other city to get through this. And we'll get through it together. We have to continue helping each other. And I just want to say that anybody who's listening to this conversation, if you're feeling like you're not getting the help you need, please reach out to the City of Bellevue. You can even email me personally at lrobinson at uh, bellevuewa.gov. And oftentimes it's just connecting the need to the resources. We have a lot of resources out there. And the more that we hear about the need, the more we can lobby for the resources we need to serve it. So on top of that, I just, as you're communicating with constituents, what are some of the things you're hearing of late and how they're, what they're needing from city council and the government? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think the general biggest need that I hear is rental assistance. You know, whether you're a business or you're a, an individual person renting a house, a household, um, that that has been really tough and one thing I'm, I'm so proud of Bellevue is that instead of putting in the rental moratorium where at the end of of that everybody owes all this back rent and the landlord is not getting any funding along the way we have put hundreds of thousands of dollars into rental assistance and we continue to do that so that people once that moratorium lifts and once people can get back to earning money, they can, uh, they don't have a bunch of back rent to pay. Thank you, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse for today's conversation and giving us an update on the state of the city. On behalf of the BDA, we're grateful for your leadership, candor, and willingness to join us here in studio. Thank you again to our program sponsors, Heritage Bank, Kaiser Permanente, Puget Sound Energy, and Vulcan Real Estate. A special thanks to the BDA board and all BDA members who keep us focused and nimble, and a huge thanks to our BDA staff who keep adapting, persevering, and making it look really easy. City building, especially here in Bellevue, is an all-in effort. Everyone is invited and very welcome to join us. We're especially grateful for the essential workers, healthcare and public safety professionals, and businesses who are working to keep us safe and the city moving forward. If you've enjoyed today's program, sign up for virtual event updates and learn more about the Heart of Bellevue campaign. The Heart of Bellevue campaign is meant to celebrate and lift up our community and local businesses during this pandemic and as we rebound. Learn more about the campaign at bellevuedowntown.com. To all, stay safe and be well. We look forward to seeing you soon.